Good morning. Um, welcome to a, a week of extraordinary celebration here at uh, Children's uh, National Health System. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who are unaware, Community Health Improvement Week. Uh, Tanya Kinlo is here from uh, the, uh, the Advocacy Institute uh, and has reminded me that this week-long uh, festivities will conclude with a uh, poster session in the auditorium tomorrow, special grand rounds at 12 noon. Uh, for us, uh, in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine, it's also a great time of, uh, of celebration. Um, uh, first of all, I get to say to you for the very, very last time, I'm Larry D'Angelo. Chief of the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Children's National Medical Center. Um, 34 years is a long time, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity that I've had over that time to uh, serve in the capacity of being division chief. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really here to welcome you to a very special event that we've had now for uh, somewhere between 29 and 32 years. <laughs> it's not quite sure how many uh, RICSI lectures we've actually had, um, but, uh, but you know, who, who's counting? Uh, it, it, it's been going, the tradition's been going on for a long time. Uh, to to um, honor the memory of Dr. Robert S. RICSI, who was a local pediatrician who trained in our division uh, in the late 1970s. After finishing his fellowship here, uh, he joined Drs. Sullivan and Ryan in practice in Alexandria, Virginia, and quickly established himself as a unique resource in the community, as well as an advocate and spokesperson for adolescents. His premature death in 1984 took from us a valued friend and colleague uh, through a joint effort of the Robert S. Rixey Foundation of Alexandria and our division, we are happy to be able to sponsor this rem remembrance of Rob on an annual basis. The spirit we've tried to capture in the Robert S. Rixey Memorial Lectureship is well personified by today's speaker, our own Dr. Lisa Tuckman, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at George Washington University and Director of Research for our division, the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine. Dr. Tuckman is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis where she received a bachelor's in social thought and analysis. So I'm sure she has some very a pithy um, uh, thoughts and comments to make about the upcoming election, but not today. Um, after graduation, she did a, a year as a Fulbright Scholar at Malawi University in the Department of Pediatrics there, and then returned to the States and enrolled in Tulane University uh, School of Medicine where she received her MD and MPH degrees. However, I'm sure she will freely tell you that the capstone experience of her medical school uh, career was the one-month rotation that she did with us in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine, uh, which I'm sure cemented her career decision to go into adolescent medicine. Despite that extraordinary experience, uh, she did move on to train in pediatrics at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital and did her fellowship in adolescent medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She stayed there on the faculty uh, for two years before joining us here at Children's National as an Avery Scholar. In seven short years, she's made a major impact on our division and on the institution. With a research focus on the critical period when patients are transitioning from pediatric care environments to adult care environments, she has gained a national reputation for well-designed and carried out studies with highly significant findings. With over 75 publications and abstracts and three major grants, she has nonetheless made time for students, residents, and fellows, and has mentored no fewer than 19 individuals in their research undertaking. She's accepted our request to be our research director, obviously just to fill up all the time that she has available. Uh, and in addition, uh, did I mention the fact that she's an extraordinarily good uh, clinician and a wonderful and good colleague. Now, you would hope that someone who is this busy in their work-a-day uh, atmosphere here at Children's has time uh, to kick back when she gets home. And I'm sure that what you mean by kicking back, or at least what Lisa means, 
is uh, helping to care uh, for three preteens and pre-adolescents, um, uh, or uh, be part of a two-career family uh, with her husband, our uh, nephrology faculty member, Shamir Tuckman. She's worked incredibly hard and has achieved so much in such a little time. I rest easy knowing that people like of Lisa's caliber are out there to be the next generation of adolescent specialists caring for and advocating for our youth. As an appropriate representative of this tradition, we honor her as this year's Robert S. Rixey Memorial Lecture. Lisa. Larry, thank you so much um, for those really kind words. Very touching. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming today for uh, the Rixey Lecture. Um, indulge me first. I have a couple. I want to take a quick poll. Um, how many people here have cared for a patient 20 years or older, either in their outpatient setting or inpatient? 25 and older. 30 and older. Wow, so about half the room. 35 and older. 40 and older? 50 and older? I didn't expect to go this far. <laughs> okay, um, whoa, I'm going to stop. Okay, so, so you get the point that we're a pediatric health system that cares for adults. And that's, you know, an elephant in the room. I have got no disclosures. Um, um, some of the data that I'll present was supported by a maternal and child health research program grant. So first I'll start with a quick case. Um, this was a recent case that actually was discussed in a morbidity and mortality meeting that I was invited to at um, here. And this is about a 19-year-old teen mother who has chronic pain, a complex autoimmune disorder. She came to our ED and was admitted for chronic pain, not controlled in the ED. Um, it was unclear if she has a primary medical doctor. Her specialist for her autoimmune disorder is located in a different adult-oriented health system. And it became quickly apparent when she was admitted that we didn't have access to all the medical information we needed about her and the expertise to care for her complex autoimmune illness wasn't available. And our subspecialist felt this was out of their comfort zone. And the patient developed multiple medical complications, but ultimately was transferred to an adult hospital on day five of hospitalization. So, you know, the, the medical part was not as relevant as the feeling that this is crazy. I'm a pediatric specialist. I trained in pediatrics. I'm being asked to care for an adult, um, incredibly uncomfortable, and very relieved when the patient was transferred. And so this is the elephant in the room, that we're caring for adults in a pediatric system. I think, you know, even working with residents, when I let them know that we're going to be admitting a 40-year-old with a metabolic disorder, um, there's often significant discomfort expressed. And so um, that's the elephant in the room, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, so first we'll talk about, I want to talk a little bit about healthcare transition and the related terminology. We can't really talk about why are patient, adult patients in a pediatric system without discussing transition. Um, and, um, and, you know, why haven't they transferred? What are the issues? What are the barriers? What's the scope of the problem? Um, and then I want to bring up some potential quality and safety related issues around caring for transition age youth in pediatric settings. Um, more and more data has become available around models of care for this population and how other, and I also want to present some benchmarking, some data about how um, other health systems have responded to this issue, because we certainly are not alone. And, and then hopefully, you know, we'll be able to take some of this, um, some of the issues that I raised today and talk about opportunities in our community and health system and our community neighborhood to improve health outcomes and really position ourselves as leaders in implementing these processes and policies for, you know, the transition age youth and, frankly, adults that we care for. Does anybody know who said this? Um, before I leave my position, I would like to recall one major issue in the care of special children which has not been adequately addressed and which is a significant barrier to our adolescent and young adult population as they pursue independence. That is the barriers they encounter and must surmount if they are to secure ongoing quality medical care as they make that transition from childhood to adulthood. 1989. 
Yeah. Okay, so see Everett Coop. So this has been an issue for a long time, decades. Um, we do have data, which I'm going to share with you, um, but this has been an ongoing issue for a long time. So, you know, because, of course, the advances in pediatric care, almost all youth, and certainly all youth in our health system, are expected to live to adulthood. And this is true for all children as they become adults. I mean, we're all adults here. We've all transitioned, I hope. And, um, you know, there are multiple life transitions that are happening at the same time. There's not just a healthcare transition. There's school and work transition. There's social transition, becoming more independent. And without good physical and mental health, all the other transitions are derailed. This puts kids with special health care needs at a disadvantage and a high risk for poor outcomes. And our responsibility, I would say, is not only to address the medical needs of our patients, but really to prepare them to go on to stay healthy as possible, to thrive in their adult lives, and find their place in the world. Because what have we done if we send them off and they, their health declines quickly? So I believe it's our responsibility also to help um, address this issue. So this is just a, um, a diagram, but it talks, you know, what, what this is saying is that when a baby is born and a child is little, everything is focused on that child, on their development, on their place in the family. Um, schools are focused on child and developing them. Um, you know, religious um, institutions, um, neighborhoods, et cetera. But as time goes on, our hope is that that person won't stay like a child forever requiring someone to care for them. Ultimately, we hope they'll enter adult life. They will be part of that community. They will contribute. They will be as productive as possible and, um, and not dependent on society, but really um, to the best of their ability, integrate into society and their community. And as we focus, um, because this is a healthcare setting, focusing on what we're talking about with transition, um, is, is really that, you know, initially people are being treated for their health condition in a pediatric setting. As time goes on, transition readiness will increase. Ultimately, someone will be transferred, and hopefully the goal would be engagement in adult model of care. Transfer can happen at any point along a continuum of being ready. And so um, adult, adult models of care have to be able to um, be ready to accept them and accept some, um, some limitations sometimes in the readiness of patients to care for their own self. So did you know there are 18 million U.S. adolescents, um, 18 to 21? So this, this affects a lot of healthy kids, and about 20% of them have special health care needs. And special health care needs just mean that they – need some kind of special services more than um, a regular healthy kid would need it or for a physical, emotional, or mental condition. And many more millions, if you counted those youth 12 to 26. And um, interestingly, youth with special health care needs in children um, account for about 80% of all the health care costs in our, in our country. And because of the significant gains in life expectancy in recent decades, does anybody know the um, how many people with cystic, living with cystic fibrosis are over the age of 18? All right, is it 25%? 50% over 18? 75%? 50%. So, so just about 50%. So, um, um, and then again, we look at sickle cell disease, um, User, you know, people are living into their fifth and sixth decade, survivors of childhood cancer, congenital heart disease, spina bifida, HIV, Down syndrome, life expectancy across the board has increased. And young adults, we know, are less connected to healthcare providers than any other age group. They're the highest utilizers of ED of any age group under the age of 75. And, um, you know, among the large proportion that do use the emergency department for their usual care, 85% of that Group that they lack to say they lack access to regular providers, and again, this is a failure of us coordinating their care and helping them move between systems. Um, and we know that poor transition and this transfer is associated with with many adverse outcomes. They forego care, or delay medical care, more likely to ac access care in a crisis, and be much sicker. Um, absence of the medical home, and for some populations, they've shown increased more mortality risk. Um, and if we go even further, you know, who is this population um, with medical complexity? Um, you know, there's really no nationally accepted definition, um, but we know that this population accounts for 3% of children and youth with special health care needs, but they're really, really high resource utilizers. So 
this small 3.2% is 19% of inpatients in pediatric health systems. They're almost half, they, they account for almost half of total hospital days and 53% of hospital charges. So this small population is, um, is very important to us and, um, and um, speaks for itself. So, um, so it's also interesting, um, one, um, Maggie Okamura did a study where she looked at the um, healthcare uh, cost and utilization project data in the national inpatient sample and looked at 125,000 discharges. And she found that the majority of patients, if she looked at patients 18 and older with congenital heart disease, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, benedicta, and found that between 67 and 75 percent of adults were admitted in adult hospitals, not in pediatric hospitals. And um, they had a shorter length of stay in adult hospitals, interestingly, when compared to the pediatric hospitals. And there were higher charges in pediatric hospitals. Um, and we also know that adults with chronic disease of childhood onset um, are frequent users of the inpatient health system um, in the pediatric system and so um, and the adult system. And there was one study that looked again at the HCUP data, sickle cell disease, and found that for the population 10 to 17 year olds, they had 27% readmission in 30 days um, in, the, in that sample. But once in the population 18 to 30, almost 50% of patients had um, repeat admissions. So there's a high readmission rate. It probably is related to gaps in care. It may be related to natural history of disease. But of course, you know, poor transitions and poor engagement will not help. Um, and so this is, well, yay. What? what? Okay. So, um, so, so this is a, um, this is a table from a study which was published in pediatrics, but um, the little the little triangles here are charges, and the um, the little squares and circles are discharges. And so the point I want to make is, and you know this is pediatric. It's a little bit hard to see, but this is pediatrics, and these are hospitalizations, inpatient pediatric hospitalizations by age group. And so you can see that you know pediatric hospital charges have increased over time. Um, out of proportion to the number of patients in the system among transitional adults, you can see that charges have increased the, increased exponentially over time, and also the number of patients in the health system and the number of discharges also has has increased more significantly than pediatric patients. And if you look at the adult patients in pediatric hospitals, um, you can see that charges have also increased. The number of patients has stayed the same but the number of discharges has, is, is higher, which means that these patients are more likely to be readmitted. So same number of patients, more admissions, higher, higher charges. And, and this is from SIS data. Um, this is done, the study was done by Goodman and published in 2011. They looked at 30,000 hospitals is where this data came from. Um, these patients represented a small proportion of the, of the patients 18 and older. Um, and the other really interesting uh, point is that hospital mortality was significantly higher among adults that were hospitalized in the pediatric setting. It was a 1.8% mortality rate than among those in the transitional age group or pediatric patients. 75% um, of the adults in the study were older than 21. Um, were also aged 23 and older, and 25% were aged 32 and older, and 10% of the population was 41 and older. And there are probably many reasons for these findings. Um, another, another group looked at um, PICU admissions. So um, they wanted to estimate the proportion of adults admitted to PICUs um, and characterize them and compare them with um, older adolescents. And so they looked at the Virtual Pediatric Intensive Care Unit Systems um, Database Registry, um, and they, um, they looked at patients 15 and older and they looked at almost 68,000 admissions. Um, about 3% were patients 19 and older, and 13 and a half were between 15 and 18. And, um, and some, some PICUs had no people over 15, and some had up to 9%. And as the age increased, the proportion of patients who had complex chronic conditions um, and planned perioperative admissions increased. Um, but again, patients aged 21 to 29 had a two times greater odds of PICU mortality 
compared with adolescent patients after adjusting for their, um, for their pediatric index mortality score, for sex, trauma, and having a complex chronic condition. And actually being 30 years or older was associated with a 3.5 greater odds of mortality. And, um, you know, although they're a small popu you know, proportion of the population, they're very high risk in PICUs. And um, that the study suggests that, you know, PICUs should have plans and protocols specifically focused in this group. All right, so now what happens after transfer? So let's say maybe people shouldn't be hospitalized in the pediatric system. Maybe they should be transferred. But what happens to pay, what do we know about what happens in terms of outcomes if we do transfer patients? So this was a study that looked at um, about with youth with kidney failure. They looked at about 350 patients, 349 patients um, from a national organ failure registry. And what they showed is that, and, and they, they um, compared non-transferred use and transferred use. So you can see that on the y-axis is the rate of hospitalization per year, and um, this is the age of hospitalization. And they were interested in looking at ambulatory care-sensitive conditions or avoidable hospitalizations, reasons that it should be able to be managed as an outpatient, people were being admitted. So over time, you could see the age of hospitalization, there were less hospitalizations as age increased. Um, although looking at the proportion of avoidable hospitalizations, those people that weren't transferred actually had higher rate of, of avoidable hospitalization than those that transferred, which was surprising. And then if you look at the, at the um, years from the data transfer, Although, um, uh, just looking at those patients that did transfer their care, that, um, that although the overall hospital rate decreased over the five years after discharge, avoidable hospital rate increased in about three to four years after they transferred. So again, something is happening. It ha probably has to do with engagement, um, and it, I think it's important that we, we look at it. Also, there's data from di the diabetes literature. Um, a study that was published in Pediatrics by Deborah Lotstein and her group um, looked at um, a, a database of newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics, and they found that, um, that the odds of poor glycemic control at follow-up were 2.5 times higher for participants who transitioned to adult care compared with those who remained in pediatric care. So again, there may be some poor health outcomes associated with transfer. This is data that, um, that I published um, on this, using the CF US um, patient registry. And uh, we wanted to compare youth that transferred and youth that didn't and look at health outcomes. And so what we found was that um, you know, the mean age of transfer was 21 years. And then the two years after transfer, the people um, that transferred had a less rapid decline in their pulmonary function test than those that stayed in pediatric care. So, an improved, you know, it was modest, but a small, but statistically significant improvement. And also, um, and also they were more likely to have had home antibiotics, but no other significant health-related changes. And we looked at, you know, six, we looked at almost 1,200 patients, comparing 600 that, 660 that had um, transferred and 660 that stayed in pediatrics. So CF seems to be doing something that is um, somehow protective and, um, and um, not having worse health outcomes. So what does CF do? Um, CF, the CF Foundation um, oversees all of the, is there any pul pulmonologists in the room? All right. Um, so, so the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation um, oversees and, um, and manages all of, and funds all of the CF programs in the country. Um, they mandate that if a pro pediatric program has more than 20 patients over the age of 18, they need to have an adult program. They need to establish an adult program to meet their needs. Um, they also mandate that you have to have a care coordinator that liaises between programs. Um, they have very specific models of care that are acceptable. Um, they provide incentives to CF centers to get patients in for quarterly visits. So if a center has complete data for a certain proportion of their like pulmonary function data and, um, and all of the things that are collected in the registry are complete, then there's a, a monetary award for, for having complete data. And so they're motivated to get patients in and have um, regular, um, regular visits. 
Um, they, they also have started an internal medicine um, fellowship, CF-specific fellowship between internal medicine physicians and pulmonologists to, um, to specialize in CF and, and work within CF centers, um, so adult providers specifically with the knowledge, and then also they engage in ongoing quality improvement, um, and that, that often focuses on adults and adult-oriented outcomes given the nature of the population being half over 18. Um, they also um, are very transparent. If you go onto the CF Foundation website, you can look up our CF Center and Johns Hopkins and see what our CF Center, which includes the pediatric and adult program, what is the average FEV1 for patients, pediatric patients and adult patients here, and then at Johns Hopkins, and you can make a decision about where's the best place to go, or you could find the best place in the country. So the transparency also drives quality, and, um, and the CF registry, of course, allows for ongoing assessment of outcomes of interest. So actually collecting the data, being able to quantify how they're doing um, is also very important. So, so what if this is really about comfort and quality of care and training providers? So what do we know about how people feel? Um, what is their comfort in caring for adolescents and young adults with chronic conditions? And this is Meg Yokomura again. She did a survey asking in, internists and pediatricians, um, you know, I would be comfortable being the primary care provider for the patients with the following conditions. And um, so, for, in, for example, internists are much more comfortable caring for hypertension than pediatricians. Asthma is about the same. Diabetes, internists report being more comfortable. Depression, more comfortable with internists chronic pain, um, sickle cell disease, similarly uncomfortable, um, and uh, congenital heart disease, pediatricians, not surprisingly, are more comfortable, and cystic fibrosis, more comfortable. Um, and then, you know, looking at residents, um, another group from Boston, Kitty O'Hare, did a study where she asked um, residents, pediatric and internal medicine residents, so these are the PEDS residents. And these are the internal medicine residents. So asthma was similar, sorry, it's blurry. Autism, pediatric residents much more comfortable, cerebral palsy, congenital heart disease, cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, epilepsy, sickle cell disease, spina bifida, all more comfortable by pediatric residents than adult medicine. And if you recall back to January, there was a grand round um, where the pediatric residents have been working with GW to, um, to implement a curriculum for the residency program jointly with GW's internal medicine residency program to try to um, improve some of this um, discomfort. Um, and so what are the barriers? So when we ask them, okay, you're just, you're uncomfortable, what, what is going on? And um, I can move this guy. Move him. Okay. Um, what are the barriers to caring, um, providing primary care to these youth with childhood onset chronic diseases? And so this was a survey of general internists and pediatricians, um, and they asked them um, about their resources that they had available, attitudes, and barriers. And 50% of internists view themselves as readily available to take on the primary care needs of young adults with childhood onset chronic diseases. And 50% and 62% of pediatricians thought it would be difficult for individuals to find an adult-focused primary care if they had a childhood onset chronic disease. And both reported lack of time and reimbursement as major issues. Um, good office systems for coordinating care were associated with improved provider perception of providing high-quality chronic illness care. slowly. Okay. Um, another study um, surveyed 241 internists and ask them, what are your concerns about caring, um, providing care for youth with childhood onset conditions? And they clearly stated a need for better training in congenital and childhood onset conditions, um, for more support for continued family involvement, as well as um, support to address psychosocial issues and maturity and um, communication from us, from the providers that are um, transferring in, in synthesis of 18 years or more of data. Um, also recently, um, in 2011, in response to these, um, to these issues, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the American College of Physicians, so pediatrics, um, internal medicine doctors, and family physicians jointly authored a healthcare transition clinical report. It was published in pediatrics, and it outlined six core elements. 
It looked at policy. Um, it looked at tracking, monitoring. It had an algor algorithmic, it has an algorithmic structure. Has anyone looked at that clinical report? Adolescent medicine people better raise their hand. Um, and and um, you know, it, was really, it provides explicit guidance, and it's really meant for all youth being cared for within an adult medical, within a pediatric medical home, but they also included um, information for adult medical homes. And internal medicine, the, the ACP this year um, released in May 2016, just last month, um, they made healthcare transition their priority issue at their at their annual meeting. And um, Dr. D'Angelo was was one of the experts working with working groups and leaders in internal medicine um, and adapting the clinical policy. Uh, I mean the, the the clinical report and all of those resources for internal medicine for internal medicine generalists and specialties. Um, their templates, specific processes. Um, and, and a whole set of resources for subspecialists um, avail freely available on, on their website. And they're now in the process of disseminating and testing these best practices, um, which are based on, you know, expert consensus. And these are the six core elements of transition. There's um, a policy, so there needs to be a policy in place so that everybody is clear within a practice when we expect a, trans a you know, patient to transfer. Um, if it's, you know, and, it, and if there is not a time, then that also needs to be clearly stated if there are certain criteria. Um, there has to be a way to track progress. Um, I know that that's, this is very difficult. Hopefully with the EMR, we'll be able to identify youth who are older age and be able to provide care for them. We need to be able to assess their skills, develop a plan, finally transfer the documents when they're 18 to 21, and ultimately confirm that they've engaged in adult care. So this is what best practices, expert consensus says we should be doing. And there's also analogous, um, analogous um, core elements for adult care. So this is data on how we're doing at Children's um, based on this 2011 clinical report and what, um, and what, we, um, what, what expert consensus says we should be doing. So this was a survey. It was done a couple of years ago in 2013. One of our former fellows, um, Elizabeth Sias, uh, did this did this needs assessment, um, and she she got respondents from um, 26 departments. At that point in time, only a third said that they had 36 percent said they had a policy in place. In terms of mandated age of transfer, um, no, there, there wasn't one for 91 percent, which isn't surprising. Um, we, nobody had a systematic way to identify patients as they got older, and 60% um, and of times families can opt out. They can say, you know what, not comfortable leaving, I'd like to stay, and 60% of the division said that was, just, that was just fine. And these are some of, some of the qualitative data, but, you know, why, why did our physicians say that, um, you know, why physicians can elect not to transfer care? Um, one person said, very complex, multi-organ issues, where the other consultants at Children's have no transition program in effect. This effectively shackles a patient to Children's with no hope for transition. Another person said, as long as a patient doesn't require surgery, I'm happy to see them forever. Um, another participant said, based on professional recommendations with support from outside the consult, if a patient refuses and no hospitalization has occurred once the patient has been allowed to continue in the pediatric practice, she's 46. Um, the patient asked to come back to children, and a specialist agrees to keep seeing them, not my choice as a coordinator. Um, and when we ask people what are the most important factors, these are the children's providers, in, you know, in preparing youth for transition or transfer to adult care, um, chronologic age and neurocognitive functioning were the most commonly cited factors used to determine when to start the process. Um, and we asked them, how often do you provide counseling about transferring to adult care? 68% never, rarely or sometimes, 23% usually, nine always. Um, we wanted to know also who's involved in the transfer of care in your department. Um, about a third of the time, nurse, social worker, or parent navigator, um, or any non-physician. And, um, you know, is there a sign-off, either verbal or written, between the pediatric and adult care team? Again, about a third of the time, no, a third of the time, sometimes, a third of the time, a third of the department said yes. So, okay, we're supposed to be doing these things. It's expert consensus. Does it matter if it doesn't affect outcomes? You know, if, you know, it takes a lot of resources to implement the six core elements. Um, is it worth doing? And I, you know, 
expert consensus may not equal better outcomes and may not be cost effective. And so while, you know, these guidelines are important and best practices and expert consensus is very well respected, there's still not a lot of data. And so, um, you know, proof of effectiveness, I believe, is the, you know, important, most important first step. Um, and so, um, so this is data from a study that we did in the Adolescent Health Center um, implementing the six core elements. So, um, so we um, implemented a care coordination trial. It was randomized. Um, and we wanted to evaluate these practice guidelines. We wanted to look at the impact of this, um, of these six core elements on quality of chronic illness care, perception of readiness to transition. We also wanted to look at cost and healthcare utilization, um, as these are really important. So the study took place in the Adolescent Health Center. Um, we're very busy. In the Adolescent Health Center, we see about 15,000 um, patients visits a year, approximately, um, and we see specialty care, we see primary care, and we care for a large proportion of youth with special health care needs. Um, the, um, they included all youth 16 to 22. Um, all of them had special health care needs. They were all insured by the same DC Medicaid Managed Care Organization, HSCSN, or Health Services for Children with Special Health Care Needs. Um, and so they all qualified for SSI. They all had some chronic disability. Um, and we, um, we stratified um, them by age, so the 16 to 18 year olds and 19 to 22, hypothesizing that they would have different needs. And we also um, stratified by care coordination needs, so low, medium, or high. And we used a standardized tool to do this, but we really, you know, because we were looking at a whole population of youth with special needs, we needed some way to identify um, how, severe, how severe or how high were their care coordination needs. So the low population were, were people with some sort of maybe an intellectual disability, severe ADHD, depression, um, severe asthma, thing, um, and then the, the, and those are sort of people that, that could probably float out and not need, like, you know, um, if they fell off the map, it probably wouldn't be too serious. We don't want that to happen. The medium um, care coordination tier was more used with sickle cell disease, survivors of childhood cancer, congenital heart disease, um, um, diabetes, people who needed to stay engaged in their care, and then the high um, care coordination needs group or people that were, you know, almost totally dependent on caregivers, um, just, you know, people perhaps like with, um, um, you know, muscular dystrophy or, um, or, or people who are technology dependent and, and, you know, always will need some help. So we, we randomized half to receiving usual control in the uh, unusual care in the, um, in the um, Adolescent Health Center, the other half got um, at this intervention based on the, um, on the best practice report. And the intervention was delivered by a dedicated nurse care coordinator. She wasn't part of our usual care team. And so first we wanted to look at quality. We used a patient assessment of chronic, uh, of care for chronic conditions. It looks at patient activation, delivery system design, decision support, goal setting, problem solving, coordination and follow up. Um, we use the client perception of coordination questionnaire. This looks at perception of patient-centered care and care quality of care coordination. And we also ask patients to rate on a scale of 1 to 10, how ready do you feel to transfer to adult care today? So we enrolled 210 patients. Their mean age was 18.9 years. 100% of them had a special health care need, obviously, because they were insured by HSDSN. 100% self-identified as African-American. And 50% of our group had moderate or severe care coordination needs. And these are the characteristics at baseline. This is the control group. This is the intervention group. They didn't differ significantly by age or care coordination tier. Similarly, low report of having discussed transition with your primary provider. Um, and also, similarly, Six, uh, rated themselves as a 6 out of 10 on their readiness to transfer to adult care. And at baseline, there weren't any statistical differences in any of our, um, in any of the things that we administered, the PACIC, the CPCQ, um, or readiness scores, um, when we can, were comparing intervention and control. But at six months, we saw that the intervention participants rated their quality of chronic illness care higher, and they reported less conflicting advice from providers. And at 12 months, um, there were significant differences seen in the PACIC. So patient activation was higher. There was higher rating of goal setting collaboratively with providers, higher problem solving um, 
um, conversation and coordination and follow-up, all statistically significantly higher 12 months after being enrolled in the study when comparing the intervention and control group. Intervention participants also reported receiving the services they thought they needed more often. They reported less, being less confused about their role as providers. They reported more frequent discussions with providers about future care. And interestingly, there was no significant differences in their rating of transition readiness so, um, throughout the study period. Um, so, you know, and, and others have shown improvement in quality by implementing care coordination. Um, those studies mostly are, la uh, you know, are limited by lack of generalizability. Um, I haven't read another one that had a control group. Um, and disease, and they're almost always disease specific. Um, looking at, you know, sickle cell disease or diabetes or markers of disease. Um, and, you know, so um, the next step are to look at healthcare utilization and cost data. So if quality is better, what is that doing for, um, for um, the, the payment data? So because we were collaborating with HSDSN, we were able to, um, we, were able, we had access to, to administrative health data, to, to cost and utilization. We looked at one year before enrollment, one year after enrollment, and healthcare utilization, inpatient hospitalization. We looked at outpatient visits and ED visits. And um, you can see that um, when we compare the control versus the intervention group, looking forward after enrollment, the, the patients in the intervention group um, had significantly higher charges among, um, than those in the control group. Um, so um, this may be because of more engagement or this population which is something special about these 53 patients that, that make them more expensive um, and we're going to look more closely at that. But if we look at the, just the population who is um, who the year before and a year after they enroll, the people in the intervention who received the care coordination, comparing them to the set themselves the year before and the year after they were enrolled, you can see that among the high care coordination group, 18, 16 to 18 year olds, year before enrollment, they cost the payer $26,000 per patient that year, and the year after, $17,000 per patient per year. And if you look at the 19 to 22 year olds, the year before, they cost $48,000 per patient per year. The year after, $32,000 per patient per year. And these weren't statistically significant at a 0.05 level, but to a payer and a hospital, you know, this is about $1.3 million of savings for one part-time nurse care coordinator, which is, I think, a great um, return on investment for sure. And then if you look at the utilization data, again, we're looking the year before patients were enrolled compared with the year after. Inpatient hospitalization for the whole, whole cohort decreased. So, for example, the year before enrollment, this group had 3.5 hospitalizations per year, the year after two. That was highly statistically significant. Outpatient services, interestingly, also were less, maybe suggesting that their needs were being met um, with a care coordinator. And ED visits also decreased. 5.3 ED visits the year before and three visits per patient the year after they've been enrolled in the study. So, you know, it seems as though investing in care coordination, at least in our small population, seems to have value. Um, and next, just for a few minutes, I want to talk about, you know, what potentially is needed to care for these adults in our pediatric health system safely and, and what are some next steps. So bringing it home, you know, we often categorize patients as pediatric or adult um, to determine the most appropriate care setting. And I think that, you know, a maybe a more relevant question is which medical setting is best for this patient. So, you know, we could have a 33-year-old patient with cerebral palsy, developmental delay, who weighs 40 kilograms, admitted to an adult hospital, maybe that patient would be better care for in our setting versus maybe a 17-year-old who has um, obesity and type 2 diabetes and, you know, malignant hypertension may receive better care at an adult hospital. It's debatable, um, but I think that, you know, the, these examples just illustrate the difficulty with labeling our patients in a dichotomous way. And, you know, as time goes on, the lines between adult and pediatric medicine are becoming more and more blurred. And I think that, you know, we as healthcare professionals, um, as we have been, you know, focused on patient individual care needs rather than simply age-based categorizations. Now, here at Children's, I'm going to talk a little bit of the models of care, and I'm just presenting at the Children's because we're, I'm going to compare to other hospital systems and how they have adjusted to these challenges. So, you know, at Children's, we're um, the Adolescent Health Center is the NCQA medical home. 
UCUs 12 to 22, we do primary care and specialty care. We do have processes in place to support transition. Um, you know, um, we don't have a dedicated social worker or care coordinator outside of, um, of grant funding. Um, and um, the Burgess HIV program does have dedicated social workers. Um, and, you know, we do have a policy at Children's um, that says that youth um, uh, can be cared for here to, through age 22. And, of course, this is individualized and it, uh, anyway, it's, but there is a policy that does exist, I am assured, um, but, but we still, you know, obviously hospitalize adults. Um, we also have a transition special interest group, um, shameless plug, we meet monthly um, and open to everybody. Um, there's also an adult care committee that many of you may be aware of that focuses on issues relevant to caring for adults in our health system. They recently focused on supporting guardianship. Um, we have a parent navigator program in Goldberg. You guys know about the parent navigator program. Um, you know, they focus on improving health care. One, they are focusing now on improving health care transition for patients and families with medical complexity. Um, and we also have templates in our EMR for facilitating the process, and I'm unclear you know, these have been translated into center, and multiple specialties are working very hard at supported transition activities and processes, although we don't really have a centralized process um, for our institution as a whole, and no really, I think, specific guidance, so a lot of us have struggled with this, um, or, you know, or, or a mandate that's clear. So let's talk about Boston Children's, what they're doing. Um, so I'm just going to focus on this on the interest of time that they, they changed their age of mandated transition, um, the range from 18 to 35 years. So they say that healthy non-complex teens um, are expected to transfer between 18 and 22. If you are transition age or a young adult um, and you see specialists, then you can stay with that specialist until you're 35 and, um, and be hospitalized until you're 35. And in the primary care setting um, with children with chronic illness, they're expected to transfer their primary care at 25 years. Um, they have a hospital-based primary care consult clinic, um, which focuses on preparing um, transfer to adult care. It's, it, they use the six core elements as their framework. Um, it's led by a med peds faculty and a team of social workers and case managers. Um, and that's, that's sort of what they're doing, which I thought was interesting, because 35 Seems very broad. Do you agree? Yeah. Um, and then I, I also spoke to some folks from um, Texas Children's in Baylor. And they have a transition medicine clinic, which is located in the adult hospital. Um, it's also an NCQA medical home. It cares for youth 16 and older um, and, and for youth with chronic, um, childhood chronic disease or disability. They have physicians, nurse care coordinators, and social workers. Um, and they have an adolescent medicine clinic at Texas Children's, but they, they are mostly specialty care, and they care for youth from 10 to 25. And um, they established in 2004 a transition committee, and they um, identified leaders in, in their center, um, in their health system, to organize a system of health care transition. Um, they also wanted to make sure mechanisms were in place to facilitate the logistics of either caring for adults in the pediatric system or transferring them and um, assuring that adult providers and systems were being readied and, and um, collaborated with to receive the patients if they was decided to transfer them. Okay, so Cincinnati Children's um, is kind of my favorite, and it's not because I trained there, um, but, but they're really innovative. So, so they, um, they actually changed the name of their Division of Adolescent Medicine to the Division of Adolescent and Transition Medicine. I'm an adolescent medicine geek. I think it's so cool. And, um, and, and so, so they have a teen center that sees patients 12 to 21. They co-locate providers. So they send providers to developmental medicine. They send providers to sickle cell disease um, clinic. And they also have a center for chronic illness innovation there, which also um, pairs together the, the research with the care for these patients. And it's located within um, the Division of Adolescent Medicine. So they, their solution was to create a hospital adult medicine care service. They, um, they hired um, MedPeds providers to be part of their division and, and care for adult patients on any subspecialty, surgical, or general pediatric services. So they are consulted when an adult patient is admitted and they 
sometimes it's appropriate to provide medical co-management for certain patients and um, if it's deemed appropriate. And they provide, they also provide care for the inpatients in Cincinnati Children's as well as the adult patients at University of Cincinnati. So they actually created a, serve, a consultative service to medically address the needs of adult patients when they are admitted. Um, in addition, what having an adult care service has done um, is that they, they have improved institutional awareness there of these high-risk patients. Um, primarily by recognizing safety issues. So they communicate with the teams regarding, regarding safety of um, safety issues, um, identifying people who are at risk for decompensation or transfer to the unit. I'm gonna move this guy, sorry, caller in four. And, um, and they, also, they also actually lead, um, they've also led the, the charge to develop adult admission order sets um, which I think is very important and cool for things like um, DDT prophylaxis, which we don't routinely do here, even though we're admitting adults to a hospital and it's standard of care in adult hospitals. Um, and then also to develop care protocols. They've developed a protocol for um, adult-oriented emergencies, things like acute coronary syndrome, PE, acute stroke, things that need to be recognized and act on quickly that I know from my experience, um, I had a patient recently admitted with pulmonary embolism, and it probably took us longer to, to diagnose it than if he had been in an adult setting. Um, and the purpose of these protocols isn't really to encourage treatment of adults with these emergencies, but to rapidly identify them and, and to activate appropriate response teams and transfer them when it's appropriate to adult institutions. Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, having having to address safety and available expertise is important. This is the elephant in the room. We're here. That, you know, we have to develop a model of care, address the elephant. We have to address safety and available expertise to take a close look at our resources, including what our nearby adult health professionals have, our staffing, our, our expertise that's available here. And it may make sense to develop additional services to support the care of adults um, because many of our specialists, you, are, are admitting you know, adults into our pediatric system, um, you know. And I also think it's, you know, it, we're getting better at this, but deciding what's best for the patient's main problem at the, pro at the time of admission. Like we had a patient that I saw in clinic that was a different patient with a PE that was, who was diagnosed on a pre-op physical, and um, she was sent to the emergency department, and it felt because she was two months postpartum, it was safer for her to go into an adult ICU. So I think that we're starting to do this um, I think there are also services that are important for adults, like palliative care um, that's very different in an adult system than our pediatric system, and fertility preservation. Um, you know, I don't believe that we offer sperm banking regularly to patients that we're starting chemotherapy on or cytoxin um, in, in rheumatology or nephrology. Ovarian preservation is also important, and we, there is a clinical trial ongoing here um, to address that. Um, and, you know, ultimately the goal is to prevent urgent health care crisis and minimize the impact um, of, of, um, of this population. And I think we have to clearly look to say, do we need, do we have, I don't think so, but do we need clear guidelines to know what to do? Um, so I think that that's it. You know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, I think partnering with adult institutions is important. Um, many divisions are developing approaches investing a lot of energy, and it may be time for a more comprehensive, systematic approach to make sure that we're safely caring for this group of patients. And so I hope that you can see now the room and the elephant, rather than the elephant in the room. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, and I know that Dr. D'Angelo um, would like to speak as well. Um, I want to uh, commend you on what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> this is really important, and it takes me back to a, a child that many of us remember um, who had pulmonary hemosiderosis, and we took care of her. Debbie Hogan, many of you who were gray-haired like I am, we took care of her for many years here, and when she was in her 20s, sometimes we would admit her to the intensive care unit depending upon the specialist who was in the ICU. Some were afraid to take care of her, so we would, enter, we would send her to the hospital center. 
And finally, the hospital center would say, okay, we'll take her. And I'd go over there and see, tell them what to do. But it turned out that uh, at one point it was finally decided, well, we ought to transition her. So we transitioned her to Fairfax. And I can tell you within two weeks, she was no longer around uh, because there is not a good transition type of operation. So I think whatever you do is phenomenal. And I think you should be really encouraged to keep it up. It's really important for our kids. Thank you. Dr. It, it's different for psychiatry because we actually have to be board certified in adults to sit for the child board so we get enough adult training. But I think one of the biggest struggles we have are with the autism spectrum patients and the intellectual disability because many adult providers, whether it's for medical care or mental health care, are uncomfortable caring for those individuals, understanding what their family needs are and their guardianship needs are, and it becomes very, very complicated. And I have great difficulty finding adult providers who want to take care of adults with autism or intellectual disability. They're just not out there. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a very important point. And actually, from a health systems perspective, this is well documented, and there's a movement in the internal medicine world to establish a specialty in developmental medicine. So specifically aimed at um, adults with intellectual disability and, um, and chronic physical limitations. And so I think it's coming and it's a response to that unmet. And there, and there are a lot of, you know, trainees also that, um, I mean, we think about in medical school, I know that Terry, um, hi Terry, um, you know, we, and, and Sade, we do, we do a three hour lecture on CF throughout the life course, which rolls in transition but that may be kind of it. And I don't know in terms of autism, what are medical students getting? What are internal medicine residents getting? And it may be like it needs a system-wide approach, and it may take many years and decades like this, you know, area has evolved, but you know, we need to do something. I agree. Thanks, Lisa. Excellent talk. Um, I have a couple of comments, and I hope Dr. D will be able to uh, maybe answer some of the questions. This issue of uh, transition, I continue to see that is a little one-sided, and I, that's one of the problems that I think most of these chronic illnesses are still facing. We, we as pediatricians, are more, we're concentrating more on our side of the fence on how to prepare these patients to move to the adult world. Um, many studies, I'm sure that you know, have shown that when they're transitioned within the same hospital, and I was part of the transition program at Hopkins for the CF patients, it's much easier and the outcomes are much better. But when you have independent or um, standalone children's hospitals and we have to look for adult facilities or carers, care providers, then they, that, that adds another level of complexity to the picture. And so when we have these programs that we set up, even the ones that you've described from Boston Children's and uh, Cincinnati, it's still within the pediatric program. I was at a um, sickle cell conference last week where they showed the um, numbers of uh, the, the, the care that the patients who transition uh, increase the cost increases because many of them that start to use the ED mm -hmm. as um, their primary, um, you know, source of um, so for pain crisis, etc. And the outcomes in sickle cell actually, uh, and I hope the hematologist will correct it, whatever I say wrong here, but that the outcomes decline, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what we've seen in CF. Mm -hmm. no, I know that data, you're absolutely right. Right. The, the regulation from the CF Center is what has, has made the transition mm -hmm. very um, successful for cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And until we have such regulations where there's mandates from both the pediatric side and the adult transition, where adult physicians come into pediatric programs to see what we do, and how to transition this patient, I think we're, we're still begging the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, uh, I can tell you that uh, the Adult Care Committee uh, will certainly take many of uh, Lisa's recommendations and move forward on it. It's been an issue which I've been passionate about 
And I know that if I say one more time to Dr. Newman, Dr. Newman, you have to help me with this, he's probably going to run out of the room. But, uh, but you know, we really are dedicated to trying to make this a better environment. I'm, I'm going to pause for a moment, first of all, to thank Lisa and give her our little oh. token of our appreciation for her hard work. And now just to shift the, uh, oh, dear. Uh, do I get a chance to say something? You certainly do, Dr. Newman. <laughs> you always get a chance to say something. <laughs> Before I run my friend and esteemed uh, colleague and fellow Duke alumnus out of the room, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, uh, Lisa, thank you for uh, just an elegant uh, presentation and your passion around these uh, uh, patients and families that. Uh, you know, are on a new frontier. And, and I think we're all feeling the, uh, the pressure and um, uh, of not knowing exactly what are the right solutions. And to do that, um, uh, and the, um, I think your approach on focusing on the science and the evidence uh, is, the, is the right one. And until we align the uh, health policy and the um, uh, payment reimbursement, uh, sometimes no matter how hard we advocate or know what the right thing to do is, there's these artificial uh, barriers. And I think the other cautionary note is we have to not just focus on physicians, but uh, if you talk to our nurses and you ask, about their discomfort in taking care of uh, complex adult uh, things that they have made choices not to do by coming to a, a children's hospital. It really, really becomes uh, an intense discussion, and that could be physical therapists, pharmacists, whatever. So it's it's a huge uh, uh, undertaking, but it's a it's one I think we should take on. And um, I I compliment uh, Larry for his. Uh, relentless uh, passion about it, and I, I think that you're on the right track, and I think as hospital leaders, we're anxious to, you know, uh, try and find the, the, the right pathways to uh, uh, help these uh, uh, kids and kids, not kids, patients and, and families. So thank you very, very much, and uh, thank you, Larry, okay. for all of your service. Um, I know this is your last time saying that you're the division chief, but I hope you'll be up here saying other things in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want you to bear with me for one moment longer, okay, because uh, if I can way to change these slides over, uh, I think I can. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind you that that part of the the uh, the job that we have today, or the or the uh, that we've accepted and and is a great treat to us, uh, is to uh, present uh, our annual uh, ELDA uh, RC award. Uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Hammond is here with us today uh, from ELDA's family um, and. Uh, this award was created through the generosity of, uh, of Dr. Hammond and his sons, uh, Gabe and Daniel, uh, and the faculty and staff here at Children's. We were all part of this. We had a wonderful uh, fundraising uh, effort uh, that everyone engaged in. Uh, you, uh, some of you remember Elda. You know, she was a wonderful member of our division from uh, 1981 uh, until um, uh, her untimely death in 2006. Uh, she was our director of medical education. She was passionate about education. She was a member of the first uh, master teachers um, uh, class uh, at uh, GW, uh, and she gave uh, to us uh, a, a commitment uh, to educating uh, families, uh, students, uh, residents, uh, and fellows uh, that, uh, that hopefully we are going to be able to honor for time in memoriam. Uh, this honors one or more faculty members annually who have made innovative contributions to patient, resident, uh, or, or staff uh, education, and it's awarded by the faculty, um, voted on by a faculty committee, uh, and uh, with nominations by the faculty. Uh, and it's uh, intended to support educational endeavors. 
Uh, you can see our list of uh, RC scholars uh, for the past nine years uh, have included uh, luminaries in, in uh, medical education uh, here at Children's. Uh, and this year, uh, we are delighted uh, to present the 2016 uh, ELDA RC uh, Faculty Scholar Award. Uh, oop, there you go, Cara. The Carla Fishing Team. for your excellence and dedication to education. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I unfortunately did not have the privilege of working with um, Dr. R.C., but um, have understood from some of uh, her colleagues that are, I continue to work with that this is an honor beyond my imagination. So I want to thank um, Thank everyone uh, for um, recognizing me with this, and especially to Terry Kind for nominating me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, and, and uh, Peter Hammond is here with us today. And Peter, uh, as, as people wander out, if you will please join us so that Lisa can take is going to be our official photographer today, as well as being the individual uh, who uh, was our fix of action. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much for the support of today and this week, very important week.